verse 13. Let's read it together. It says this, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said to him, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Father God, we are grateful, God, that there truly is none like you, and God, that you are faithful to your people whom you have called. And God, you're here in this moment to speak to us, to turn this natural encounter into a divine and supernatural acceleration into all that you have for us. So God, our ears are attuned, our hearts are open. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we sit down, high five two people and ask them who really needs church. Come on now, ask somebody, ask somebody, ask somebody, ask somebody. We are uh, starting a new series today called Ecclesia. Ecclesia. We even put it phonetically under so you can say it with us. We put this out, people are like, what, what, what's in Inglesia? Is Enrique Inglesia coming to church? I don't know what's going on here. I said, now I'll just show up. Ecclesia, no, I, I hate to spill the beans. It's nothing deep. It's just the Greek word for church. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said, you are Peter on this rock. I will build my, he would have said, Ecclesia or my church. Uh, if you're new here or you've never heard me tell one of my rants and stories, uh, I am a pastor's son. My dad has been a pastor longer than I have been alive. And if you by chance have heard rumors about some of the issues that pastor's children have, I am here to let you know they are all true. Every last one of them. And, and, and part of my issue of being a pastor's son is I am a little bit cynical. I am extremely sarcastic. And I am incapable of doing what I'm told, unless you give me a good reason. So for example, if you say, hey, I need you to do this, I am going to say, but why? And if you say, because I told you so, then I can't do it. If you say, well, because it's what good people do, then I definitely can't do this. And I'm not talking about like 14, 15, 16. I'm talking about me today, right now. I still have that problem. For example, last year, I went to Israel, and, and then we went to the Wailing Wall, and there's all these people, and they're in front of this wall where the temple that Solomon built unto God is, and they're, they're praying, they're praying these prayers to God in front of this wall, and the, the people write their prayers on, on a piece of paper, and they stick it into the wall, and I'm watching these people pray, and these different pastors are coming here to pray, and I'm saying, I ain't praying here. Well, this is, what we, this is part of the Torah. Come and pray. I'm like, no, I'm not praying. Like, My God's not in no wall. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, interceding on my behalf. I don't need to come to a wall to pray. I can pray wherever, and he hears my prayers. Until I went home and read the Bible. And Jesus said, yes, I hear your prayers everywhere, but there's a special blessing when you pray at the place where God's holy seat actually is. It says that in scripture. And I said, can y'all take me back? Can y'all take me back? I missed that. You, you, you miss things if you're cynical like I am. But here's one good thing about being like me is you'll never do something that you don't understand. I find there are so many people that they have practices in their life that they do it because they were told, but they don't truly understand the why behind it. And because you don't understand the why behind it, it's not yours, it's the person who told you. Like going to church. Why do you go to church? Who really needs church in their life? I go to church because that's what Christians do, okay? 
I, I, I go to church because I was just raised in church. I was just, I was just my grandma went to church, mom went to church. They just told me good people go to church. I go to church. All right. You got anything else than that? Do I need anything else? Yes. Yes, you do. Uh, I was preparing for this series and kind of studying, and, and I was doing one of the research projects that I normally do when I study for a message. I went to the barber shop, and I asked my barber, what do you think the purpose of church is? And I was actually very surprised by the response that I got from him. It was actually really, really good. And I actually, it's kind of shady that I was surprised. But he said, here's the purpose of church. The purpose of church is to pause in your week and to give God thanks for your life. To take a moment to acknowledge the fact that you are not self-made. That you are not doing it in your own wisdom, in your own strength, but it is the grace and the favor and the mercy of God. And just to let him know, I am grateful for what you are doing in my life. Now, that's a good answer. Somebody say amen. If you ask somebody else, they would say, well, I go to church to hear an encouraging and inspirational word that's going to move me forward into the purpose and the plan that God has for me. I go to church to be able to lift my hands into worship and to acknowledge God and to let him acknowledge me. If you kind of go outside of like our little Christian circles, though, and you begin to ask people like, What's, what is the church? Some people would say that the church is one of the most antiquated organizations in society today that has failed to continue to evolve as society and understanding of humans and, and culture has evolved. The church is one of the most closed-minded, ex exclusive instead of inclusive organizations today. Some people would say that. If you ask other people, they would say the church is the only safe, holy, sanctified place left on this God-forsaken planet. You need to go to church to get away from this dark, dark, evil word and just wait until Jesus comes back and saves us all from the debauchery that is going around us and burns this planet to the ground and starts over. Some people would tell you that's what church is for. You ask me, I would tell you church is the family business. Now, now that may sound negative, but let me kind of unpack that. Two weeks ago, I was playing golf on a Sunday. It was amazing. I've almost never done that before in my life. And I did go to church, but I was on vacation. So I went to like the early service. And I, you know how early you get out of church if you go to early service? You have like, y'all don't know because y'all at the 1230 service. <laughs> Your whole day is gone. You have the whole day. So I walked out of church like 10, 15, like, what am I going to do? I'm going to play golf. I got nothing else to do. So I get to golf at about 11 o'clock. And, and if you play golf, you, you know you kind of go out there. And if you're by yourself, they'll pair you with three other people. And it's always awkward as a pastor when they pair you with three other people because you know you're going to have to talk in between holes. And, and they're inevitably going to ask you, like, what do you do for a living? And as a pastor, you got to decide, am I going to lie or not? Especially on a Sunday. Like, oh, I'm a pastor. Like, oh, really? And I go out and they pair me with these two other gentlemen. And you're like, what do you do for a living? And I'm like... I'm a consultant. <laughs> hey, you know, and they're smoking cigars and drinking beers and all this other kind of stuff. And I usually kind of play with them a little bit. And then by the eighth hole, they're like, so who do you consult for? I'm like, Jesus. Ah. <laughs> but this particular day, when I was a gentleman, and one was a grandfather, one was a father, and one was a son. It was three generations. And they were all either retired or active duty military. And they were just telling me how military is the family business for them. The grandfather did 30 years and then retired. The father is at his 30th year and has no plans of retiring. He's continuing on. The son just graduated college as an officer and has been active duty Marines for two years. And they were just saying, this is what our family does. And I was just kind of, you know, connecting with them, saying, hey, you know, that, that, that's kind of like my family. But, but instead of the U.S. Army, we're in God's Army. Ministry is the family business for Chandler's. My dad's been a pastor longer than I've been alive. My uncles are pastors, and, and my grandparents, they weren't pastors, but they were heavily involved in the church. And I have uncles who aren't pastors. They're architects, and they build churches. It's just kind of the church is what Chandler's do. I, I grew up in church. If you watch me worship, some Sundays I'm on the front row, I'm just like, yeah, God is good. Other Sundays I'm like, oh, God is good. Other Sundays I'm like this. Why? Because I have played every single instrument there is on this platform. If you grow up as a pastor's kid and there's a gap, you get plugged in. Dad's like, hey, the drummer left. Steven, you're it. <laughs> you ever played bass before? Nope, you're playing this Sunday. Learn. So I've played drums. I was horrible at that. Played bass. I was worse at that. Played piano. I was okay. Led worship sometimes. I mean, I've just kind of just grew up in this world. 
you guys, Easter Sunday, you're out getting dressed. I'm not getting dressed. I'm out on the street with my dad and siblings with little door hangers, hanging door hangers on people's door the day before Easter saying, hey, you should come. And, you know, sometimes you go to hang it and the person's there. Hey, what's this? It's an invite to church. What, to Easter? No, we don't believe in Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday on the Easter and pagan holiday. This is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I would like to see you there. That's kind of how I grew up. I don't want to scare you, so we're going to pivot. Somebody say pivot. Cool. I'm going to take you to theolo theological class or seminary for a second. In, in theology, there's this term called hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is simply the, the proper understanding or, or approach to a historical text, particularly a, the Bible. And in the study of hermeneutics, they have a law called the law of first mention. And basically what that law states is that if you want to know the original purpose of something, don't ask anyone. You ever played the game telephone? You have like five, six people are like, hey, you tell this person, tell that person, tell that person. And by the time it gets to the last person, hey, hey, cats are fluffy. And the sixth person is like, I like fluffy pancakes with macaroni and cheese. So it's like, that's not what was said. No, if you get your opinion from people, it's going to be altered as it goes. The law of first mention says, if you want to understand the original purpose of something, find where it is first mentioned in Scripture. And from there, you will find the original and only intent God had from that first mention. The reason why we understand that marriage is between Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve is not because of the evolution of society. It's not because of our opinions or our preferences. It is because when God defined marriage, he defined it the first place, the first time, the only way. And as a created being, we don't have the right to make a second mention that supersedes the first mention. I'm preaching already. I had three weeks. I'm ready to rumble. <laughs> so if we want to know what church is for, we don't need to ask anybody. We just need to find where it's first mentioned in Scripture. The first time Jesus used the word church was in this passage, Matthew chapter 16. And I love how scripture allows us to eavesdrop on these, these historical conversations. Jesus is here with his disciples, and they are having the age-old, who is the goat, the greatest of all time? Is it LeBron or is it Jordan? And, and Jesus is talking with these. He's like, hey, who is the greatest? What do they say? What's the word on the street about your boy, Jesus? What, what are they saying about me? And the disciple says, oh, Jesus, it's all good. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're Elijah. They're debating over which problem. But here's it. Jesus, you are definitely top five. Now, I don't know if you're number one because you know how these people feel about Moses. Moses is like, he's there. But Jesus, it's like, it's like magic, Chamberlain, and then Jesus. You are right there. And then Jesus changes the question from what do they say about me to who do you say that I am? By the way, they got it wrong. Jesus was not one of the prophets. He was the prophet. He was the son of the living God. But notice how Jesus never took the time to correct the they. Listen to me. Jesus does not care what they think. He wants to know who do you say that I am. So he's like, oh, he finally started preaching. We got there, didn't we? Now, here's the thing. When he said, what do they say? All the disciples had something to say. When he said, who do you say that I am? No one had anything to say. Except Peter, who, who was the spokesperson for the disciples. And he says, oh, I know who you are. You are the Christ. You are Mishaka, the Messiah, the anointed one. You are the son of David, the one that we've been waiting for. You are the savior of the world. Now, you have to understand something about Peter. Peter had many struggles in life and faced many diseases. And one of the diseases that Peter faced was foot and mouth disease. Peter had the ability, unlike anybody else, to put his foot in his mouth every time he spoke. He never got it right. He was so wrong. One time Jesus called him Satan to his face. That's how wrong he was. So when Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus' response is like, oh my, me, God, I cannot believe you got this right. There's no way flesh and blood revealed this to you. 
He said, Peter, there's no way you got the right answer on your own. The only way we would know this is if my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. And he said, Simon, I call you Peter. And on this rock, I will build my, then he uses that word, church or ecclesia. Now, that one uh, verse in the Bible is the cause of more denominational splits than almost any scripture in text. There's so many different opinions on what Jesus meant by, I will build my church. If you come from a, ba a Catholic background, you were taught that Jesus was in that moment uh, uh, electing Peter to be the head of the church. Catholics believe that, that, that Peter, St. Peter, he's the head of the church. And if you were raised in that type of understanding, guess what? You're not necessarily wrong. As you read through scripture, every time they would list out the disciples, Peter would be the first name that they listed. It was always Peter that spoke up. Even in Acts chapter 3, he was the spokesperson of the church. If anything needed to be corrected or changed, it was Peter who would set the new rules. Peter literally was maybe not the head of the church, but he was the leader of the church. Now, if you were raised in a Protestant background, you were raised, Peter ain't no head of the church. Jesus ain't gonna leave no human to be the letter. Jesus is the cornerstone, the cornerstone. Christ, Christ, the solid rock. Ain't no Peter, the solid rock. Christ, the solid rock. I stand all other ground, including Peter, is sinking sin. <laughs> so you were raised to believe what Jesus was saying is the ideology that Jesus is the Christ. The Son. That is what he's building his church on, the idea that he is the savior. If that's how you were raised, you're not wrong either. The church is built on the fact that there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. I have uh, something to tell you. There's no five paths lead to heaven. It's not ever what you believe is what you believe. There is only one way to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ. While both of those are true, I'd like to submit to you that Jesus may have been saying something else. As he's talking, he said, you are Simon. Simon in the original Greek means pebble. But in this moment, Jesus said, your name will no longer be Simon because of the revelation of who I am that you just had. Your identity has changed and I cannot leave you with a name from the past. Now that you have a new identity, I need to give you a new name. So I will now call you Peter or in the Greek Petros, which means rock. Somebody say upgrade. He used to be a pebble, now he's a rock. By the way, an encounter, a revelation with God doesn't just save your soul, it changes your identity. The Bible says the old has passed away and all things have become new. And you may have the same name on your birth certificate, but God is calling you something different than who you used to be. He said, you used to be Abram, but that's when you had no kids. Now I'm going to call you Abraham, the father of many nations. You used to be Jacob, the trickster, the liar, the manipulator, but I'm going to change your name to Israel, the father of my people and my nation. Is there anybody in here who knows that God calls you differently than who you used to be before you encountered him? He said, you used to be a pebble. Now you're a rock. And, and on this rock, I will build my church. There it is on Peter. Well, no, because he said, your name is Peter Petros. And on this rock, Petra. Jesus used a different word when he used the word rock as opposed to the word Peter. He said Petra, which is rocks, plural. Wow. Remember, Peter and Jesus were not having an isolated conversation. There were 11 other tongue-tied disciples that were watching that had nothing to say, but they're still eavesdropping, and Jesus didn't forget about them. He said, Peter, you're the man. You got it right. And hey, y'all, on all of you, these rocks, watch this, united. Petra means many different rocks packed together so tightly that they make one large boulder. Jesus said, I'm not building my church on Peter and I'm not building my church on an ideology. I am building my church on individuals that are so tightly tight together under the name of Jesus Christ that the gates of hell cannot prevail. Listen to me, church is not a building. It is not a message. It is not an emotional experience. The church is the people of God connected. Right, right, write this down. 
The church is a people, not a place. Do you know it is grammatically incorrect to say that you are going to church? Let me give you an example. You say, where are you going tomorrow? I'm going to church. Where'd you go? Oh, I went to church today. Would you say I am going to football? No, if you love Jesus and you're a Ravens fan, they're synonymous, by the way, and you are going to a Ravens game, what are you going to say? I'm either going to a Ravens game or I'm going to M&T Bank Stadium. You're not going to say I'm going to football because people are going to look at you like you're crazy. You're going to watch football? No, I'm going to football. No, no, no. You're going to the arena where football takes place. Where are you going to church? You're not going to church because church is in a building. You are going to the building where church takes place. But it's not a church when you leave. Oh, you missed it. This is not a church when you leave. The second you walk out the door and we lock the doors behind you, this has ceased to be a church. It is now just an empty building because the church left. The church is not a building. The church is the people of God that are packedly tight together, that are united under one purpose and one cause and one mission. Church is not an inspiring message. Church is not sing. Do you know you could come to church, hear a great message, which you always do at Destiny Church? <laughs> you can sing some phenomenal songs. You can drop a very large offering in the basket at the end of service, go home, and still not have gone to church. All you did was have your personal devotion in a public setting. Because preaching doesn't make it a church. Worship doesn't make it a church. And giving your offering doesn't make it a church. The only thing that makes it a church is when the people of God make a decision. I no longer am going to be isolated, but I am going to be connected, united, tightly packed together with other believers. This cannot be the church if we determine on being isolated. Peter said this in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. The Bible calls Jesus the chief cornerstone. I had a, a, a trip to Israel. I was telling you about I actually went to that temple, and I, I saw the cornerstone of that temple. That cornerstone, they say, is 570 tons. One ton is 2,000 pounds. According to my iPhone calculator, that one stone is 1,140,000 pounds. Today, engineers are dumbfounded how they could move such a stone with such their primitive equipment even back then. Today, it is the largest stone ever moved in any architectural find to this day. The Bible says that it's the chief cornerstone that was rejected by man, but is what we build our life on. But look what Peter said. He said, you also, not just Jesus, you also are living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The Bible says the church is each and every one of you, your hard-headed, rocky self. You are a stone that God is knitting together to build into his house. Now, if I were God and I was building a temple for myself, I wouldn't use stones. I would use marble or, or I, would, I would use bricks and mortar or something that it would look just amazing. But for some reason, God decided to use rough, edgy, little bit cracked divots. Do you know it does not matter how much you try to grater on a stone? It will always be just a little bit rough. And maybe you're here and you're like, man, I don't belong in church. I have issues. I still struggle with my anger and, and, and pride and my marriage is not all together. And my children, they love Jesus on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but Tuesday and Thursday, they're trying to still figure out where their brains are and it's just not all together. That's the type of people that Jesus uses. Yeah. He says, I don't want perfect people. I want stones that I can put together. God says, I want tax collectors and, and I want Pharisees and, and prostitutes and people that the world's given up on and I'm going to take them and I'm going to build something that the world has never seen so that they would know. It's not because of the education or the income or the, the greatness of the material that I use, but it's the builder. 
that has made them great. Now, some of you, you don't want to get connected at church because you feel like I have some edgy stuff about me that's not quite smoothed out yet. You would be wrong. Others of you, you don't want to get connected at church because you're like, church folks, they're, they're fake. They're phony. They have issues. They're rocks. What do you expect? When you connect with the rock... It's a little hard, <laughs> but you a rock too. I don't know, I'm church folk, you know, they ain't they, they, they phony. They're phony at your job? You didn't stop going though, did you? <laughs> All of a sudden when it comes to your paycheck, you ain't that worried about who's phony or fake. You just like, oh, just make sure you give me that memo one time and I don't know if I can trust people. Listen, sometimes, I'm going to be honest with you, doing life with other people, it gets messy. There will be offense. And you know what an offense is? It's a great opportunity to forgive. It's a great opportunity to show the love and the grace of God. But for some reason, God has decided to take some imperfect material to build one of the great or the greatest thing here on our second thing I want you to write down is this, is, is the church is not just people, but the church is God's authority. There's a few things that I love in life. I love Jesus, I love his church, I love sports, and I love my family. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a sports fiend fanatic. I, I love almost all sports. I can't really get down with baseball and Orioles, you understand, but almost everything else, I'm just, I'm in there. Love football, love basketball, I'm a basketball. I mean, from the first season to the end, I am in every single game. People are like, how you feel about LeBron going to LA? Are you a Lakers fan? I said, no, I'm not a Lakers fan. I'm a LeBron fan. So I've been a Cleveland fan, I've been a Miami fan, I'm a Cleveland fan, I'm an LA fan for now. We'll see where we go next year, but I'm just saying, I'm you may not really care about sports. It's amazing the leadership principles you can learn from sports, but I want to submit to you something you may never realize about sports. Whether it's baseball, whether it's basketball, whether it's football, every time a sporting event takes place, there are three different teams that take the field. There's the home team. It's their city. It's their fans. It's their stadium, and they are defending. We must protect this house. Under Armour, shut up. It is their job to defend their home field. They have studied the opponent. They have practiced. They have prepared, and they are ready. Unless they're the Cleveland Cavaliers, then they've done nothing but showed up and lose. But other than that, every other team has prepared for the battle that's about to ensue. The visiting team, they got on a bus or a plane. They've studied film. They've worked out. They've practiced. They have made it their mission. They have come up with a strategy to tear down the opponent's goals and to walk home with the victory. There's the home team, and there's the away team, but there's a third team on every single field, and that is not a team in purple or gold or in navy and maroon. It is a team that is usually in black and white, and they are the officials on the field. They don't represent the home team, and they don't represent the away team. They represent 645 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, which is where the headquarters for the NBA is. The officials on the court, it's not their job to put points on the board or to take points off the board. It is their job to dictate the course of the game and to make sure it goes along according to the rules that has been set by the headquarters. Now, it's very interesting because as you watch a game, you would think that the officials are the most inconsequential people on the field. They are normally the oldest, the weakest, and the slowest. All of the athletes are usually stronger, faster, and younger. And you would think stronger, faster, and younger would always supersede older, slower, and weaker. The only problem is the officials have something that none of the players have. The players can dunk. The officials can blow a whistle. And my whistle can cancel your dunk. The players, well, only Steph Curry can run and hit a shot from half court. The official cannot hit a shot from half court, but the official can turn on an instant replay and find that shot did not leave your hand before the hit clock hit zero. The shot is now non-existent. And don't you dare argue with me because I'm going to give you something called a technical foul, which means don't try me again. 
try me again and you are going to have a short night. I will send you to the locker room before the game is even over because you have power. I have authority. Too long as the people of God have we viewed ourselves as the home or the away team. Are you for us or are you against us? Are we winning or are we losing? And we have to understand that Jesus did not die on the cross for home or away, but he died on the cross for what happened with Joshua when he encountered the angel of the Lord that said, are you for me or are you against you? And the angel said, what? Neither, but I have now come as a representative of the kingdom of God. I would like to submit to you that when Jesus said on this rock, I am building my church, my ecclesia, he was not saying I am building my religious social group. He was not saying, I am building my religious holy huddle that is supposed to stay unadulterated by the world, waiting for my return. The word ecclesia is not even a biblical term. It's a governmental term. If Jesus was speaking in 2018, this is what he said. He said, Peter, you are my rock, and on this rock, I will build my Congress, my Parliament, my Senate. The word ecclesia means the called out ones. We've taken as called out of sin into grace. That's not what it means. It means called out of being a normal citizen into a governmental position. Jesus said, here's my goal for the church, that you would rule on earth until my return. That you would be the standard bearers that dictate the course of history and society. Can I tell you some of the darkest seasons of history in our entire world has been when the church was the most silent. There are stories of them piling hundreds of thousands of Jews on trains, taking them to concentration camps, and as they would go by churches, churches would just sing louder as to not hear the screams of the people that were going by. So often we blame Capitol Hill or Silicon Valley or the education system or the law enforcement system or all these different governmental agencies that we feel are failing us, I'd like to submit to you, and I'm not saying that we should not hold our government accountable, but I feel we are expecting our government to do more than God ever ordained them to do. And the reason why the government has the responsibility to do it, to be honest, is because the church has dropped the ball. It is not the government's job to take care of the widow and the orphan. It is the people of God's job to take the widow and the orphan. It is not the government's job to take care of a child's heart. It is the church's job to take the top care of a child's heart. And when the church doesn't do its job, then we need metal detectors in our schools. Then we need sensitivity training and all these other things that have been, it is not social media's job to say me too. It is the church's job to say no longer is this going to take place in our country. We are going to stand up and be the people that God has called us to be. I am so tired of the church following society. That is not biblical. Society was always supposed to follow the church. We are the standard setters. We are the ecclesia. The, could you imagine what would happen if Congress said, how do you feel about this law? There are 250, 300 million people in America, and Congress would get 300 million different opinions. Congress says, we are the ones that have been elected. We will decide what we think is best, and that's the law of the land. When God says, you are the church, you are the one that I have elected, stop asking 300 million people what they think and start looking to my word based on what I said and lead according to that. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, God's purpose is now to show the rulers and the powers of the heavens the many different varieties of his wisdom. Watch this. Through the church. So the Bible says that God's ways don't make sense to unbelievers. Like if you're not a Christian, God's ways are not supposed to make sense to you. When we get confused as Christians, when people don't, 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 don't hold biblical standards, they're not Christians. 
What do you expect? So when you say things like sex is made for marriage, wait for marriage, the world's supposed to say, huh? That don't make sense. What if it's not my soulmate? How are we going over compatible? How are we, like, you know what I mean? No, no. That's how they're supposed, that's not how the church is supposed to respond, by the way. Just leave that there. When you say to the world, you will be wealthier and have more peace and have more purpose when you give God the first 10% of your income, the world is supposed to say, what kind of scam you running? That doesn't make sense. That's how they're supposed to respond. And, and the world looks at God and says, your ways don't make sense. And God looks back at the world and says, yes, they do. And the world looks at God and says, prove it. And God says, well, look at my church. He said, the purpose of my church is to be the evidence that I submit into this court case. Oh, you don't think waiting till marriage makes sense? Look at how the church is doing. Oh, you don't think honoring me with the first 10% of your income? Look at how my, oh, you don't think forcing your kids to honor me is how it works? Look, he's supposed to point to the church and say, this is what it looks like to really live life. But I feel like sometimes God is saying, look at my... Hold on one second. Where y'all at? <laughs> the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 19, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Yeah. Oh, the world, the world hates the world hates the church. The world's trying to close the church. The world's anti-church. Anti That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the world is waiting on the church. That there's an anxious, there's, there's an agony, there's a, there must be more to this, and I need something else, and I know it's supposed to be the church, I just can't find the church. Wow. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to be graphic or anything like that, but I believe that when there's a shooting in a school, it's the world groaning saying, we need a church. When there's another celebrity on social media, TMZ, Shade Room, or whatever it may be, with their lives completely torn apart in front of all of society, which has now become the new normal, I believe that's the world groaning, saying, we need a church, we need an example, we need to see a better way to do this. Where is the church? Here's the problem. The church is missing in action, not because you're bad, but because the enemy has strategically fed you a different definition of church. So we are thinking we are churching because we went to a place and got encouraged and, and shouted a message and all that other kind of stuff, not understanding that that's not the church. That's where the stones are being smoothed out just a little bit more so that we can go out and be the ambassadors of Christ that he's called us to be. For some reason, over the last 30 years, I've been brainwashed to think that church is about me and my blessings and my happiness and my joy and my purpose. So I'm not even thinking about about representing Christ anywhere because I've been told it's all about me. I got some bad news, boo-boo, it ain't about you. I know this is gonna come as like a shock. God did not create the whole universe because of you. He loves you. He wants you. He has a plan for you, but it's not about you. It's about his kingdom and us representing that. That's just a lot of pressure. I didn't sign up to be in Congress. I just didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> Why would I want to be the church? Well, the first reason you should want to be the church is because it's your purpose. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image. The whole purpose of humanity is to be, be walking reflectors of God here on earth. He says, as he was, so are we here on this earth. The second reason you should want to be his church is because that's the only place you're going to find fulfillment. You know how many people we've told come to church and you'll be fulfilled and they leave empty? Because we thought fulfillment was found in going to a place. Fulfillment is not found in going to a place. Fulfillment is found is in being a people called out by God. Your job does not bring fulfillment. That promotion that you are going after, go after it, get it, and tithe when you get it. But that will not bring fulfillment. <laughs> because that was never, some of y'all ain't laughing. I'm joking. You can still tithe. She, <laughs> 
fulfillment was only brought in us being who God's called us to be. And the last reason you would want to be the church is because the church is the only thing that God's advancing. Got, 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 got any worried about advancing your life? Can I just, I'm, I've had three weeks, I'm be ignorant. We're going to end this message on time. Don't, I, I don't want to be too Stephen. I know I'm a pastor, I need political correct. God don't care about your business. Oh, you don't, let me, let me clean up. Y'all know I say like controversial stuff and I clean up. God does not care about your business. God bless me, why? Let, let, let's play this game. God, I want you to bless my family. I want you to bless my marriage. God, I want you to bless my business. God says, why? Because I'm yours and you're mine. <laughs> what else you got? Watch this. God, will you bless my business? Why? Because my business and my life is all about being your church, being an example to the world of what it means to be an honoring person unto God and by advancing the kingdom of God. And as you bless my business, your kingdom is advanced. And he says, yes, that's what I've been looking for. God, I'm single and I need somebody to marry. Send me my spouse. Why? Because I'm lonely. So what? <laughs> Go watch a Netflix. God, I want to get married. Why? Because there is no greater image of the love of Christ here on earth than a husband for his wife and a wife for his husband. And God, I want to reflect your kingdom here on earth. I've been waiting on the right answer. Let me say, listen to me. It is when we become the church of God that he is able to advance us. We were always intended to be held up on a pedestal as an example to the world of what it means to be a follower of God. But until we become his church, his ecclesia his example to a dying world we position us in a place where our advancement doesn't benefit him any but when i'm the church my advancement brings people to him last thing is this it's the church that's invincible the bible says in matthew chapter 16 verse 18 and i also say to you that you're peter on this rock i will build my church in the gates of hades shall not prevail against it. I'm going to get you to scream two things. I tell one story in less than 60 seconds. I'm going to pray we're going to get out of here. Does that work? Take me back to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 18. He didn't even mean that. You know, people say, take your time, Pastor. Take your time, Pastor. People don't even mean that. Take me back to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. It says this. You are Peter and on this rock. You guys got it? Also, I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my, somebody shout it out. I, I didn't say you was doing it. I also say to you that you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against. Shout that word out. Yes. So the first word is. Church. The second word is. Yes. What is it referring to? Church. church. So this verse says, oh, you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against a Christian. That's not what it said. It said the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. What is the church? Christians tightly packed together. One of the things that breaks my heart is the gates of hell is advancing against Christians, destroying marriages and destroying businesses and destroying finances because we don't realize that when we are isolated, we are at a victim position against the enemy because it's the church that the gates of hell cannot advance against. And when I am connected to the church of Jesus Christ, I am invincible, but when I am isolated, I am exposed to a jacked up world. Jesus said, when you stay connected, packed together, the enemy can't touch you. But when you're out there on your own, you scream Jesus all you want. Because it's his ecclesia that he died for is coming back for. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. We're grateful. We're grateful. We're grateful. And God, we pray that what you did in us, that it wouldn't just stay in us, God, but that it would infiltrate, God, the homes, the jobs, the community, the city that you've placed us in. God, use us not as Christians, but as your church, as your ecclesia, as an example to the world that God's ways make sense.